so thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, um, and yeah, it's great to be here and great to see some familiar faces on the call. Um, so I'm going to be talking about state-owned enterprises and um, particularly looking, um, I guess, at their role in climate change and, and, um, and in the electricity sector in particular, um, we'll, we'll um, present some thoughts about what, you know, what role these entities play and, um, uh, and, and how we might motivate them uh, to do more to decarbonize. Um, so as, as So Young mentioned, my, um, a, a lot of this work is, is informed by um, work that I did as, at Stanford as a, as a doctoral student. Um, I finished my doctoral work last year. Um, uh, I've sort of continued working in this area um, through, uh, through my affiliation at Oxford. Um, um, but have also increasingly done sort of applied work with SOEs. So this presentation is um, a combination of some of the academic work, um, uh, as well as some sort of practic, you know, some work I've done in practice. Um, and so I'll try to keep it, um, I'll try to combine a little bit of the kind of theory with, with, uh, with, with some observations from, from um, working with some of these firms. So the overview of what I'll try to cover today um, is really, there's really three parts. Um, firstly, uh, I'll, very briefly about what I mean by an, a state-owned enterprise, why they matter for the climate crisis. Um, I'll do a deep dive into the electricity sector in particular. Um, and then at the end, we'll uh, make some um, what could be done better uh, to motivate these firms to, to, to decarbonize? And really the key outcome I think that I'd like to get to at the end of this presentation is for, for folks to have a better understanding of, of the pathways for decarbonizing SOEs and how they differ um, and how we ought to think about them differently to investor owned firms. So I've, I've start with this picture of uh, what what we might think of as the archetypal state-owned enterprise. This is the state grid corporation in China, which as many of you know, is you know the second largest firm by revenue behind Walmart globally. I think it employs something like a, a million people. Um, it's the largest electric utility globally. Uh, and you know these types of behemoths, um, oh, and importantly, it's it's hundred percent owned um, by the, the the Chinese government. Uh, and so, ordinarily, I think when folks think about SOEs, they think about these types of behemoths. Um, and indeed, um, uh, these types of hundred percent owned, very large corporations are are oftentimes what we are referring to um, when we talk about state-owned companies. Um, uh, and this data, which is taken from the IMF from 2020, um, shows that indeed Chinese SOEs um, are a very significant contributor to the total pool of of what we what um, what we might think of when when we when we look at the universe of these firms. Um, but of course, China is not the only story. Um, uh, there are SOEs still in 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 many countries in. Uh, you know, many of you will be surprised to know that in the United States, there are many state-owned companies in the electricity sector in particular, the Tennessee Valley Authority, um, the thousands of municipal-owned firms. Um, uh, there are state-owned enterprises in, in Europe, in Australia, and many other uh, liberal democratic countries around the world. And so, um, so I wanted to make that point first and also to highlight here through this through this figure that uh, state-owned enterprises are remain very significant parts of the global economy. So this figure is showing you the share of um, state-owned enterprise assets amongst the largest 2,000 firms, and you can see there uh, that it's it's in 2018 it's r roughly representative of of one fifth of um, of the global economy. So very significant indeed, and particularly when we're thinking about climate change. Um, 
as I mentioned before, you know, state-owned enterprises now take multiple different forms. I think the traditional one was what I, what I was explaining before about state um, state grid. Um, but after sort of decades of reform efforts by the IMF, the World Bank, and other development finance institutions, as well as by governments themselves, um, the the picture of SOEs is slightly different now. It's, we, we, there are several firms that are partially privatized, um, as well as many that remain wholly state-owned. Um, and, uh, and I think in addition to that, What's what's important and what we'll highlight, what I'll highlight later in this presentation is that, in addition to variation in the amount of state ownership, there's also quite a lot of variation in the governance models that are used uh, to govern these firms. And um, from my point of view, at least, I think those governance models are really critical uh, for when we think about climate change because they really influence the dynamic efficiency, the the rate of change, and the ability of these firms to change in response to um, transitions in the economy and, uh, and to climate risks more broadly. But I'll come back to that point a, a bit later on. So just returning now to the universe of SOEs to give you a bit more of a color, you know, a bit more color to what, what we're talking about here. Um, and just to kind of highlight the significance of these firms when we're thinking about climate change in particular, this slide really just highlights um, the um, the distribution or the the you know the um, the distribution of these firms regionally um, uh, and across sectors and I've highlighted here obviously some some significant high emitting sectors um, I've highlighted the electricity sector obviously because that's what we're going to focus on today um, but uh, but you know the, there's there's a lot of um, really important work that's going on with respect to SOEs in, in other sectors in the oil and gas sector and uh, in particular is one that you know, um, you know colleagues at Stanford and elsewhere have been have been doing lots of important work on as well um, but what's what's I think interesting here and that folks often find interesting on this slide is that there are a number of firms here that are um, that that perhaps uh, you've seen before uh, but you may not have realized we're state-owned enterprises. Um, uh, in the transportation sector, there are a number of airlines. Um, uh, in the electricity sector as well, um, some familiar names there. Um, so what, the, what, what this really all means, I guess, for, for climate is that um, SOEs um, are very significant global emitters. Um, there are some early efforts underway to estimate the contribution of SOEs to, to global emissions. Uh, and so my colleagues, Alex Clark and, and Philip Benoit from Columbia University have recently just put out a working paper um, where they've looked at a sample of 300 SOEs um, and estimate the, the emissions of, of these firms to be about 7.5 gigatons um, so that's direct emissions from from these firms alone, which, on on their estimates, that would put SOEs as a group as a as a as a um, as the as larger emitters than every country on Earth except for for China. So, um, underlying, I guess, the importance of of thinking about SOEs um, for uh, for climate change. Um, so. I wanted to go now a little deeper into the electricity sector in particular, as I mentioned before. Uh, and really these first couple of slides are, um, um, are, are the more sort of specific um, representation of some of the more general points I made earlier. Um, so the first point being that, um, that in the electricity sector, um, state-owned companies um, still are the dominant players. Um, so on the on the left hand side, um, there's some uh, analysis that I've done looking at um, a representative sample of of global utilities and uh, oh sorry of of global electric um, electric generating assets and and the sort of ultimate owners of those assets. Um, 
and uh, and based on that analysis, um, you know, we, we can see that the the vast majority of firms um, that uh, that are electric generators um, in the electricity sector remain state owned. Um, um, we can come back to definitions later on, but um, uh, in this case, the um, uh, uh, what 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 I used to define state ownership was um, firms that had over a, a, a small threshold, so ten percent of of state ownership. Um, and you can see on the right hand side, there's um, the global distribution, I guess, of those um, of those firms. So countries that are shaded darker are countries where there is more state ownership um, in the electricity system of those countries. The, the main point being <clears throat> that um, that there is significant state ownership in the electricity sector uh, across countries. Um, And this matters because um, state power companies own very significant fossil fuel based generation assets. Uh, so this figure just compares investor owned utilities to state owned utilities, um, looking at, at three different um, uh, energy sources. So this is looking at um, asset level data uh, from 2018 up, sorry, up to 2018. Um, and I think, you know, the main point here is that um, state-owned companies um, uh, are holding a very significant share of, um, of coal assets in particular. Uh, so, so that's the bad news. Um, I guess the good news is that, um, and, and sorry, the, the bad news, I think, is, is very consistent with the... Um, uh, the orthodox story about state-owned enterprises, that these are lumbering behemoths that are um, reticent to change um, uh, and, and, and rarely do so. Um, but what's you know, interesting is there's some emerging evidence that state-owned enterprises, in the electricity sector at least, um, have also been at the forefront of transition. Um, uh, so these firms are, in some cases, um, uh, at, you know, first movers in in making technological, um, in adopting technologies um, and uh, in developing new technologies. Um, so, um, to give you a sense of that, I guess on the on the left hand side here we have um, we've got um, a figure here which which lists out. The, the largest global utilities. Um, uh, and it shows the relative adoption of, of clean energy versus certain fossil, fossil fuel energy. Um, uh, and the lighter shades, um, the lighter shaded companies here are those that have greater state ownership. The point being that um, you can see at the top of this list, there are quite a number of um, state-owned companies that uh, that hold a, a really large proportion of clean energy. Um, um, and more anecdotally, there's there's obviously a number of uh, of case studies that have been put forward about um, state-owned companies uh, and the transition. Perhaps one of the more famous ones is the story of Orsted, um, which um, used to operate as the Danish National Oil and Gas Company and is now um, the largest offshore wind um, producer globally. Um, and it started making that transition. It's a partially privatized state-owned enterprise. Um, um, uh, and, you know, for, for reasons we can talk about later, um, um, you know, le leveraged, I guess, its, its role as a state-owned en enterprise. Um, um, quite effectively to, to, to make that transition. Um, the other, you know, the other case study is uh, what that I've highlighted here is the New York Power Authority uh, and some innovative work that they have been doing in New York State. Um, so happy to come back to those later on if, if folks have questions about those. Um, but the main point being that <clears throat> um, there is, is this emerging evidence that is contrary, I think, to 
kind of or orthodox economic theory about state-owned enterprises, su suggesting that, in fact, sometimes SOEs can um, be quite innovative. Uh, uh, and so there's, there, as a consequence of that, there's been um, a recent proliferation of um, academic work looking at why some state-owned enterprises, particularly in the electricity sector, are more willing and able to um, innovate and, and in particular to adopt clean energy than others. Um, and I won't go into the details of, of this, but this, is, um, this slide is just to represent a simplified way, I guess, how we could think about the literature um, in this area. So I've given you, um, I think I shared um, with Katie and the team, an, an article here um, uh, from the OECD, which is the Prague et al. Um, paper, which really represents, I guess, the first category of how folks have been thinking about this. So there's some analysis which suggests that there's something inherent in state ownership, um, in, in, in governments owning firms, that makes them more able to um, decarbonize and to change. Um, so there's, there's, you know, that's that's in a very simplistic way the 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 argument of Prague at all. Then there's there's a kind of a middle group who argue that well, state ownership in and of itself may not be the whole story, and that actually it's a combination of state ownership and the prevailing policy conditions of the government that owns the firm uh, that seems that that matters um, and. Um, I'm highlight here a, a working paper from some folks at MIT um, who, who make that argument with respect to a bunch of utilities in the EU. Um, and then there's a, th a third category, which um, I'd put myself and colleagues from Oxford and, and Columbia who mentioned before who were on this topic, who, who take a slightly different view, which is that state equity ownership um, actually doesn't matter that much. Um, what actually matters for decarbonization and for innovation at state-owned um, power companies is, is more driven by the corporate governance and financing structures. So state equity um, um, may play some role at the margins, but it's not the, the kind of main explanatory variable. Um, and so I wanted to present that to you because what, what I'll go on to say now really fits within my kind of theory of, of, of explaining this, but of course there are other theories and I've, I've given you a paper which presents a, another perspective on this. Um, so, so I guess, um, you know, the way I look at this is that, um, and, and I've tried to simplify it here really that we can think about innovation at state-owned power companies on, on the base, basis of two sort of vectors. Uh, on, the, on the one hand, there's, there's lots of variation, as I mentioned before, in the governance models of, of how governments manage the state-owned companies um, in their portfolio. And I'll, I'll explain what I mean by the governance model in a moment. But the basic point there is that on the one hand, you can have very controlling strong states that that have a lot of control over um, SOEs. And then on the other hand, um, uh, governance models where the state gives much more freedom to the SOE. Um, uh, and then on the y-axis, um, there's variation in, in how governments think about innovation and their, their interest in SOEs. So on the one hand, um, you have some governments that are very eager to use SOEs as a as a driver or a pillar of their innovation policy, uh, and then on the other hand, um, um, some some governments that are disinterested in using um, uh, SOE for that purpose, but instead want to use them for other purposes. And so, if we split the universe up in this way, we can plot um, we can plot utilities. Um, um, as fitting within each of these different um, each of these different quadrants, and so I've just given some examples here of utilities that may be familiar to folks um, uh, that might fit within these different categories. So I mentioned the New York Power Authority before, 
um, uh, NIPA, you know, has uh, operates more within this strong state where the, the state government has quite a lot of influence over the SOE um, and uh, and it operates in an environment where the the um, the state government has strong interests in 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 using the utility for um, clean energy innovation um, in this in the quadrant two I've given the example of New Zealand's Genesis uh, which is a um, partially state-owned power company um, uh, operates under a much more independent model um, um, uh, again with a government that with relatively strong interests um, um, and you know I mentioned Orsted before um, uh, the other example there is um, CFE which is a monopoly state-owned utility in, in Mexico um, which again operates under the strong state model um, in a context where there's there's less interest in, in using it for clean energy innovation. Um, I should explain now what I mean by the governance model and what specifically, what are the kind of aspects that make this up. Um, so um, there, there's a lot here and I won't go through all of it um, just in the interests of time, um, but the the purpose of this slide is to to highlight the um, the various tools, uh, the financing and regulatory tools that governments can use and do use with respect to managing their state power companies. So, um, you know, we've clustered this um, in, in different categories. So so the state states have some direct powers um, over state over the state-owned enterprises that they manage. This can include, for example, approving the um, SOE's um, investment strategy. Uh, it can include um, introducing conditions on the types of uh, fuel that they use for, for generation. Um, states, in some cases, have um, power to appoint board members and management um, as well. And as you can imagine, um, that can very significantly increase the level of influence that the state has over the utility and, and its decision making. Um, there are also a number of rules, uh, sort of conditions with respect to financing. So um, some utilities are able to access uh, private capital markets, which, which, in, which can give them a, a level of independence from the state. Others are limited um, in their ability to do that. Um, there are a few terms here. Um, the, the tunneling and propping, um, which may not be familiar to folks, that really refers to the, uh, a practice which is common within SOEs um, where, where the state um, either uh, uh, can, well, the state will either take some of the revenue uh, from from SOEs and divert it for other policy purposes, um, or um, or um, conversely, um, can can provide financing to the SOE, um, even if it's pursuing an activity that's not commercial. Um, uh, and then the last category is, is, is state financing rules, um, which which also can can vary the level of state control. So. In some cases, um, governments offer debt relief um, or, or government guarantees. Um, um, they can offer concessional financing for, for certain projects. Um, oftentimes we see this in relation to fossil fuels, um, a country that has very substantial fossil fuel um, interests will often um, use their SOE to uh, to uh, support that industry, um, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail uh, in a moment because I'll present a, a, a case study of, of a single firm just to kind of illustrate some of these features. Um, so the in before I go to this slide, actually, um, so you know the. Um, uh, the research that's been done in this area and um, has shown, has looked at sort of different firms' ownership structures. So 
wholly owned firms or, or listed firms, and then um, compared the clean energy outcomes of those firms, um, taking account of the variation of the different governance structures. Um, so in other words, um, holding, holding equity constant, what effect does these differences in corporate governance have for, um, for clean energy outcomes? Um, uh, now, in the interests of time, I won't be able to do a full comparison of, of multiple different firms, but as I said before, I'll, I'll just um, do a deep dive into, into one case study uh, to give you a bit of an example of, um, of how these features play out um, on the ground, and we can, we can discuss um, others later. Uh, Arjuna, before we move on, can I ask one quick question about this more fundamental of, uh, SOE? Yes, of course. Yeah. Yeah. So it is very interesting that, uh, you know, the globally SOE has a large portion to the, you know, to the carbon emission. Uh, and then I'm curious about, you know, it's apart from the, the carbon emission share, but, you know, what was at the beginning that the that create the SOEs? You know, like a, why the first point that you know government create the SOEs, and is there any movement that you know governments trying to uh, you know like let those state owned enterprise go into the market? Yeah, it's it's a great question, So Young. I mean, I think. Historically, um, SOEs have been uh, introduced in government, well, in, in circumstances where there's a market failure and so where um, private firms have not been um, um, yeah, willing or able or uh, to, to, you know, to provide services. Um, and so uh, you see a lot of state-owned enterprises in, um, uh, the electricity sector, for instance, because that that model came out of, um, I think, in its very early days um, when electric utilities were first created, uh, there was a problem in, in the United States of, of private utilities um, um, basically using their monopoly power to charge exorbitant amounts. For, for electricity. And so you had the development of municipal owned utilities uh, to provide you know, publicly owned um, electricity at cheaper prices. Um, uh, I think you know, that's, that's not always the case these days. I think there's variation in um, the prevailing kind of um, government sort of uh, uh, you know, government philosophies. <laughs> um, and so you, you see, uh, obviously, um, you know, a very large number of SOEs, as I mentioned before, in China. Um, um, sometimes those SOEs are, are, are responding to a market failure. And sometimes that's, um, that's just driven, uh, you know, that's driven by the, uh, the, the approach to the Chinese state to the economy. Um, um, and I, I, the the other thing is that you know I think there's a lot of path dependency here. So so you so governments in previous eras have set up state-owned companies, um, and um, and they haven't been able to relinquish control of those. Um, and and this case study that I was about to talk to is actually quite a good example of that. So PLN is a monopoly utility in Indonesia. Um, it is a very substantial global emitter um, um, because it you know, provides electricity to, to 300 million people. Um, and as I'll explain in a minute, is, is very dependent on coal for power generation. Um, but it was established, um, it was established and um, as you know, by the Indonesian state during a time when the government was, um, very explicit about having a, um, a kind of a, a socialist um, um, well, approach to uh, to governing 
and that was embedded in its constitution and um, and as a consequence, there's been multiple efforts to privatize PLN over, over the years. Um, uh, the Asian Development Bank, um, the World Bank and others, I think, have, have, um, have made attempts. But, uh, but because of the fact that it was, you know, included in the Constitution, there was a, a path dependency uh, that was created and uh, it hasn't been able to be privatized um, and, and so that phenomenon, I think, also repeats um, as well. Sorry, I can see um, I can see a hand up. Yeah, <clears throat> sorry, that's that's me, Puti. Hi there. Um, yeah, so I, I'm a quick introduction, first year engineering student, but I'm actually from South Africa. Um, worked a bit with ESCOM, so super, super relevant and really excited about this talk. Um, my question, I, I kind of got it's a two part question, but I guess the first question is. Um, how much of a factor does the actual ownership structure play in the maneuverability? Um, and that's from the sense that there's also kind of the supporting uh, regu regulatory infrastructure that this utility sort of sits in, right? So um, if we look at the case of ESCOM, for instance, uh, there's renewable IPP programs that have been mandated by government, but that might not work as well as say a renewable feed-in tariff, uh, which creates a lot more of a different market structure um, or the system buyer, for instance, is embedded within ESCOM, and that obviously affects the maneuverability of, of that utility. Um, so my first question, I guess, is just related to how much of a factor is ownership in the grander scheme of things? Um, and then the second part, you know, tied to that factor is um, the actual structure of the utility itself. So I think, um, you know, to your point, there's, when you look at the, the trends of utilities, there was this big shift from State owned to some some utilities private privatizing, but there was also a big shift towards unband, unbundling utilities. Um, but as as you see in Africa, a lot of utilities are still very much vertically integrated. Um, mm. And I'd be curious to understand how much of a role that also plays in terms of um, yep. driving towards you know decarbonization. Yeah, thanks, Fuji. That's a great question and um, terrific to have you on the on the call. I'm sure you'll have. Um, lots of other things to say um, um, when when we get to the discussion, but I think so. I think to yeah, I think you've raised a really important point, which is um, you know the market structure. Um, market structure matters a lot, and I think part of what motivated um, you know this research uh, was. Um, was 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 precisely I think the point that you're making, which was that oftentimes some some of the earlier work that's looked at this has kind of looked at equity ownership, state ownership in isolation of other other factors, um, and when clearly you know the the market structure, whether whether utilities are vertically integrated, whether there are IPPs as you say in in, in the market, and whether um, um, uh, yeah, I guess the way the government is intent, you know, using the utility uh, within that broader context is really important. Um, so, and and some let let me try and cover off some of those points um, in this in this case study because I touch on some of them, um, um, uh, and maybe we can come back um, to to those issues at the end if we if we have time. Um, so I think. Um, I, I won't. I won't go through a lot of this background um, in, in in great detail, but it's su suffice to say, I, I mentioned before PLN. It's based in Indonesia. Um, Indonesia's a, a very significant global emitter, um, roughly four percent of global emissions. The power sector, um, PLN is is a monopoly um, utility there, uh, and so. Um, it's it's the main contributor to power sector emissions, which we've included here on the on the right hand side. Um, and again, I think the key point, and I mentioned this earlier, is that um, its uh, asset base, the PLN's asset base, is is largely um, uh, is fossil fuel heavy, um, and uh, it. It owns a lot of the assets itself. Um, there is, uh, there is, a, you know, um, 
there are some independent power producers who PLN purchases power from within the country. Uh, but again, the, the, the vast majority of those are um, from, from fossil fuels. Um, so to, I guess, return to that framework from before, um, we might think of PLN as fitting within um, this, the fourth quadrant really. So within a strong state governance model um, where there is, I'd say limited um, government interest in using the firm for clean energy purposes. Um, I've put an arrow there because I think there's been a few recent policy changes which um, suggest that that may be changing, uh, but in any event, um, um, it's, it's, it, it's most appropriate, I think, to think of it as fitting within that quadrant. Um, so to explain that a little further, um, and, and this, I think, this hopefully should cover some of, um, uh, I guess, Fusi's question before, which is, you know, how much does the broader context matter? Um, uh, and my answer to that would be it matters a lot. Um, this image here is, um, is, is basically a, a, a map of the institutions governing PLN um, within Indonesia. Um, and you can see there, there are, um, it's immensely complicated. It's very far from being uh, a utility that's operating in a, a market, a, a free market um, environment. Um, uh, the utility is influenced by um, a whole range of policy determinants. Um, uh, the, the rules on, on tariffs, for instance, and importantly are set by the DPR, which is the um, national parliament. So it's a very, um, it's, it's the, the tariffs are not market-based, they are politically set. Um, you can see that the, um, the Minister for Energy and Mineral Resources has um, a very significant say in terms of the, um, the, the strategy that the, that the firm pursues. Um, uh, there, are, there are a number of things here, I won't go through all of them, but the main point being that um, PLN is, is very heavily regulated by the state. And, um, and if we think about that governance model that I outlined before, um, this is a sort of simple way of representing that. Um, obviously, the red boxes are are those categories which um, which you know PLN might fall into, um, where um, it's 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 quite hamstrung in its ability to make um, a technology change to change from its very coal. Uh, and coal and oil dependent electricity generation structure because um, yeah because of the um, because of um, the level of state influence and um, um, as I mentioned before the 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 other interests driving the state's use of PLN and so what I mean by those other interests are um, um, there are a set of really significant political barriers in the country um, to decarbonizing it. Um, one being that, that coal, the coal industry is, is very much at the center of, of energy security and um, regional employment uh, and competitiveness. Um, you know, there, there, there are a number of ways in which coal is, is quite locked into the political economy of the country, key political figures um, own assets in, in some of the key mining businesses. Um, um, uh, there are also economic development objectives that the government is trying to achieve through uh, exploiting its cheap coal, um, coal reserves. Um, and what that means in PLN's case is that there is a um, there are subsidies uh, which which basically enable um, PLN to access coal uh, at a much cheaper rate than um, than uh, than renewables and um, and that in part is is creating a stickiness um, where 
on a on a pure market basis, um, uh, you know, renewable alternatives are are now competitive with with fossil fuels. Um, so um, again, there's a lot there. I won't go through each of those points um, um, in the interest of of having a little bit of discussion at the end. Um, uh, I will just say on the right hand side here, you know, there are. Um, this is obviously very driven by politics. Um, there are some signals that maybe the politics are changing. Indonesia has has set a um, um, an, a nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement um, of up to a forty one percent emission reduction. Um, you know, a sizable proportion of that, oh, and, and that sorry that NDC is trickled through to. The country's energy plan, um, uh, and there's there has been an increase in ambition um, um, over the last few years, um, and so um, you know, in, in addition to that, the, the government has um, introduced some carbon pricing policies, uh, which include the electricity sector, and so there are some signals that things may be changing, um, but uh, but. I guess what I presented to you was really the state of things as they are today. Um, so the last segment of this presentation was really then to think about well, what um, what what might work. I mean, I've presented a fairly bleak picture, I think, in relation to to PLN. Um, uh, we could do that analysis for for a number of firms um, uh, and. Um, um, and I guess we keep getting back to this question then of well, what 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 can be done about it? What you know, there's you're all doing this course, I imagine, because you're interested in clean energy transitions and you know the opportunities for sustainable finance to kind of influence um, firms uh, uh, positively. And so um, um, I thought I'd, I'd, I'd throw out some kind of high level ideas um, and which we could we could discuss a bit further. The first point I wanted to make, though, is that a lot of the kind of climate policy tools, I think, which we have in our toolkit, um, are not uh, immediately that the logic of them does not work as effectively for state-owned companies as it do, as they do for investor-owned firms. So, carbon pricing, for instance, um, really works effectively on the logic of of firms that that care a lot about market signals and market price um, of technology so so you know if you put a price on carbon a rationally acting market driven utility might um, might make a transition away from uh, from from um, technology that that has this additional carbon um, price on, on top of it um, but that does not work as well when we're talking about firms as as we've seen in the indonesian case um, that uh, are making technology decisions on the basis of political and policy factors not just price signals um, the other the other kind of tool which i think is getting a lot of traction there's lots of discussion at the moment with the sec's new rule rule making process underway on climate risk is you know financial regulation of of um in 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 the capital markets um you know as as i've discussed some soes are listed and so that can actually be a useful tool for some of them uh, but in many cases um again soes are not really responsive to that because uh, they don't have exposure to to capital markets um the the other category here i've put there is is sort of performance standards um introducing performance standards for utilities um um this can be quite effective but um we know from uh, research on soes that there's there's these persistent problems where you have a government that's trying to regulate a utility which is also the owner of that utility uh creates a significant um limitation on the effectiveness of of government regulation so you know point being that i think um that what what's needed i think when we think about soe decarbonization is a, is a is a different toolkit starting from looking at the governance models that i've been talking about um and some of the um factors that might influence um uh, the pr 
government priorities and how they use these firms. So I've sketched out here again, using that kind of basic framework, a few um, um, initial ideas and, and I'd be very interested to kind of, you know, hear thoughts and perspectives on, on this, on, on how, um, you know, how, um, how to influence SOEs. So thinking about both of these vectors, you know, on the, on the one hand, you know, how do you change government priorities and how they use SOEs? Um, so I've suggested, um, you know, thinking, you know, lobbying for green industrial policy, um, uh, using SOEs as a, um, as a lever to gain a competitive advantage in a country, um, um, you know, creating, I guess, advocating for greater accountability and transparency for SOEs, particularly on, in relation to their climate performance. Um, so, you know, we see, although there's been quite a lot of um, improvement in, um, in, in relation to listed companies and the information that they're expected now to produce to shareholders, um, uh, that, the, the uptake of similar reporting for SOEs is still quite limited. And so there may be some gains there and having greater transparency so that we can continue to do research like the research I mentioned earlier and get better estimates of actually what share contribution do SOEs contribute to a country and to global emissions. Um, another idea there is um, on that vector is strategic climate litigation, which might... Um, which might um, sheet home responsibility to the state for an SOE's contribution to, to a country's um, carbon emissions. Um, and then on the, on the governance model side, um, you know, there, there, are, there are a number of activities, some of which are already ongoing. So um, um, uh, one way of disrupting a, a strong state Kind of governance model is to um, is to to actually make the directors of state-owned companies themselves responsible for the climate impact of firms. So um, there's some work happening in Australia at the moment on um, analyzing the 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 duties of of directors of public authorities or SOEs as they're referred to there. Um, um, and uh, and exploring whether there are actually embedded within the legal system that governs these firms, whether there are duties on directors to, to manage climate change risks. Um, um, some of the other kind of thoughts there on, on the governance model was leveraging existing um, public oversight um, systems. So, a lot of SOEs are subject to um, state auditing bodies. Um, so are there opportunities within the rules that govern state auditing to, 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 um, to interrogate or to hold accountable SOEs for, uh, for their emissions? Um, um, and then a, a couple of other thoughts there about how, how it may be possible to use um, private leverage the kind of private financing um, uh, to influence SOEs. So, you know, obviously I talked about PLN. PLN holds something like $30 billion in, in, in debt. Um, a sizable proportion of that is, is private um, bondholders. Um, and um, when, when you kind of break down and look at the actual uh, um, entities that are holding PLN's debt, a lot of them are large financial institutions that have made commitments um, to net zero um, publicly. So, you know, there may be opportunities to influence SOEs through, through that mechanism as well. Uh, and then the final point there is just, um, there are still substantial SOE reform programs uh, within um, you know, development finance institutions, World Bank, ADB, amongst others, still fund um, SOE reform programs. Um, uh, and so, you know, another option is to is with with those ongoing efforts to um, uh, to kind of introduce a 
um, um, a, a green reform process to 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 think about these vectors um, and and make reforms that might actually incentivize um, technology change rather than just focusing as those programs currently do on on static efficiency um, to focus on dynamic efficiency as well. So um, that was a very rapid overview. I'll stop there because I'm running out of time, but um, thanks very much and re really interested to hear your thoughts or questions. Thank you, Arjuna. Uh, now let's open uh, our stage for questions from the audience. Um, uh, can I? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I, I just, um, I guess I have what, like one question on on the matrix here, which is it almost seems like, um, like inherently within this, um, how do you deal with the, the scenario where you have a state-owned entity that's say controlled by government, but is more on the independent side of things? Um, I guess looking at a couple of these, it seems like it's very much focused more on utilities slightly within sort of the right side of the quadrants. Um, I'm just curious to, to, to know if, if some of these can be applied to some of the more independent um, SOEs. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I think um, on, the, on the independent side, I think there are actually quite a few different opportunities for influence so um, um, so a lot of those firms for instance will have private equity holders in addition to the state equity holders and um, um, in some cases those private equity holders themselves can be a, a, a useful sort of point of leverage um, 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 so I gave the example of PLN and its bondholders. So the same logic might apply for, 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 for the private holders of some of the more independent firms. Um, I think the, the other things that are relevant there are, um, um, you know, I think in, so I, I gave an example earlier on of um, Orsted, um, which was, um, which is a, I think rightly classified as an independent firm. It's it's um, it was partially privatized at the time that it made its kind of large um, sort of transition from being a national oil and gas company to being a um, offshore wind producer. And the way that it did that in part was it leveraged um, uh, its ability to raise equity finance uh, to kind of fund its. Um, offshore wind expansion, um, and so you know, I think, I think, I think the thing with the independent firms is that they um, that because they're less influenced or there's less levers, I guess, for the government to influence them, they're able to be driven more by um, their own strategic priorities and and you know the influence of their investors, their other investors, um, non-state investors. And so in Orsted's case, at the time that they that the CEO wanted to make this transition, um, um, you know, there's some um, uh, there's some case study at, um, documentation of this that that suggests that the government was very strongly opposed um, uh, to that strategy. Uh, they wanted to that they wanted Orsted to remain a, uh, a national oil and gas company. Um, but because, you know, there was more independence because they were able to raise that, that money, uh, um, because there were fewer levers of, of state control, uh, the CEO was able to kind of pursue that strategy anyway. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Um, and sorry, maybe just one, one more quick question would just be, um, I, I noticed that I think one of the the, the, the hot topics of, often spoke about in terms of decarbonizing energy grids is decentralization. So in the integration of you know decentralized renewable energy assets within the grid. Um, curious to hear your thoughts, you know, on that in terms of the the SOE model, since I think you know from the SOE perspective, it's kind of a, 
a threat to their existing business. Yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's a threat. Um, it's a threat to a lot of utilities. Um, um, I. I mean, I think it depends a lot on. Um, it depends a lot about on the kind of broader structure of the um, of the electricity market um, in that we're talking about. So I think in in relation to monopoly owned utilities, I think the kind of distributed energy problem um, um, is is very significant because um, uh, yeah because. You know the monopoly provider usually has very substantial uh, asset ownership, um, and they need a path to wind down those assets. Um, uh, and you know, I I think that's this is a this is a live issue with the case study I presented with PLN, um, where you know it's in a region where there is potentially there's there's a lot of potential for much greater renewable and distributed energy uptake in particular. Um, uh, but with a very young coal fleet um, and, you know, very few options to finance a transition away from that coal fleet, um, uh, it, it's it's tricky to do so. So, um, you know, in, in, to explain that a bit more, you know, there are some proposals um, that that are being explored at the moment for the private sector or for development finance institutions to to, to in effect buy PLN's existing coal assets as a way to kind of give them a bit more freedom um, to generate um, power from other sources, but um, but it's uh, but but a lot of private investors are resident, you know, hesitant to to take on those assets because they've made commitments to the market that they won't own coal assets, even if the coal purchase is to eventually wind down that asset. Um, um, so there's, yeah, there's there's a number of kind of intersecting problems here, I think, um, um, in, in addition to, I guess, it, it's, well, I, I, I guess it's not just a state-owned enterprise problem. I think it's a, it's a kind of a broader problem for electric utilities. Thank you, Arjuna. Um, I think our our time is up, uh, and then we had to save a lot of a uh, lot more cushion, like especially for myself. Uh, but we can have a separate discussion. But for those of you who have cushion to uh, Arjuna about uh, the study, uh, you can always email him because he's at Stanford, uh, so, which is great. Um, thank you, Arjuna, for joining us today, uh, sharing your work. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.